Thank you. Um, disclosures, nobody else pays us to do anything but our jobs. And uh, objectives, just as the title suggested, we're going to re review concussions. And part of the reason this topic was included for this audience, there's been a recent just explosion of information um, on this topic. And we know a lot more about concussions today than we knew even a year ago, and certainly a whole lot more than we knew five and 10 years ago. Just since the start of this year, there have been three major publications, uh, either position statements or uh, practice guidelines and recommendations that have come out. One from the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. The uh, International Concussion Group publishes, uh, published their fourth consensus statement in March. Um, this is probably the leading group in the world on the subject. They met several times over the past uh, decade. Uh, they initially met in Vienna and came up with a great set of uh, guidelines and recommendations. They, a few years later, met in Prague and put together a document that I, put together a document that uh, I think created more questions maybe than it answered. And then their four, third and fourth uh, set of guidelines have been just uh, f fantastic and useful documents for clinicians. Uh, their last two meetings were in Zurich, so the main thing you can pull from this group is that they really know where to hold a meeting. I don't know if we can get them in the DC Center in Omaha, but they're always around. And the American Academy of Neurology updated their position statement on the subject. So unless you are someone who's really staying on top of uh, current research in concussion, it's, uh, it's going to become difficult to just know where all this information is going. So what we've done is tried to summarize where are we today. A few points about just terminology, traumatic brain injury, mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, very, uh, again, all similar terms. Mild traumatic brain injury and concussion have, in many uh, groups, become synonymous. I tend to use the term concussion when talking to uh, families in the lay public and uh, even other healthcare professionals because I just, I feel like people have a better just feel and understanding as to you know, what that is and what that means and what we're talking about. And over the last several years, the two uh, probably big things that have come out that are useful for people, and with my background in sports medicine, the question is always, well, when can I get back to play? When's it safe to play again? And we've developed some return to play recommendations, and more recently, some more uh, what we call return to learn guidelines. And the analogy that I give a lot of families is if you're a basketball player and you sprain your ankle and right away I ask you to run up and down the basketball court, what's going to happen? Your ankle's going to swell up and it's going to hurt. Well, if we ask our student athletes who've just injured their brain to go back and study algebra and geometry, guess what? They're going to have problems. And that's uh, one thing that we've really, really noticed in the last, uh, especially a couple of years. So what is a concussion? Most of what we know about the biology of concussion comes from animal models. And I always love basic science researchers because they come up with some kind of really unique ways to test things. But uh, what they've essentially done is uh, anesthetize lab rats and thunk them in the head and then measure what happens. And what they've found is for about four to six days after a significant impact, you get this kind of chaotic metabolic crisis where you have potassium ions flying out of the cell, calcium ions flying in, um, the sodium potassium pump is in disarray. You've got decreased ATP production. So if you go back to your high school biology, the brain, the cells of the brain just aren't producing enough energy and then they don't function well. Blood flow to the brain is decreased. And again, this whole mismatch lasts for about five days. The key thing is, there's no cell death as long as there's not a second injury while that first injury is recovering. So huge piece, uh, there we go, huge piece of kind of real useful data from the basic science world. And this is just a nice schematic of the, the physiology. Since I kind of talked about it, there we go. The, that second blow before the brain is completely recovered. 
is, uh, there's a term called the second impact syndrome, which is primarily a pediatric problem. Outside the pediatric world, it's really only described uh, in detail in boxers. And it presents with sudden hypotension, significantly increased intracranial pressure to the point where you've got anoxia and ischemia of the brain, autoregulation is really just shot, and you have true cell death of, uh, on a huge scale. And the morbidity for this is nearly 100%. The uh, ones who do survive uh, suffer really profound uh, neurologic impairment. So what are our risk factors? Uh, again, past history of concussion. One of those kind of new areas of research, there should be some published information coming out very quickly regarding history of, prior history of concussion, how severe were those symptoms, and the uh, how long ago was that impact? In other words, if I had somebody with a significant concussion, concussion um, within the last several months and compare that to somebody who had another significant concussion a decade ago, they typically respond differently. And we've seen that clinically, but there's uh, some published data that hopefully we'll be seeing in the very near future on that subject that again, can help guide us in the clinic. Uh, the other things that are important are evaluating the number and the severity of concussions and the overall duration of symptoms. Back when I worked in the sports world in professional hockey, I had a, one of my players was a Harvard graduate and he was playing in the pro world and he'd been hit in the head so many times he could literally just stand there in the training room, shake his head and induce concussive symptoms in himself. And it was at that point that he quit hockey and then decided to use that degree he got from Harvard for something. And, uh, but, but he's done well. But, you can see just that cumulative effect of repeat blows to the brain and uh, you know, how's the brain going to respond to that. Uh, female genders is again a risk as well as uh, kind of pre-injury comorbid uh, behavioral issues. Mood disorders such as depression, ADHD, learning disorders, and uh, young people with migraine headaches all kind of complicate the picture. If somebody gets hit in the head, their head may hurt, but not every headache is a concussion. They could have a sinus infection. They could suffer from migraines. And as a clinician, it's important to try to sort out what's important and what's not. And also, aggressive style of play, especially in collision sports, is a risk factor. And that aggressive style of play can often lead to poor technique, especially in football, hockey, rugby, soccer, and basketball are the big ones. And typically hitting someone from behind or uh, with their head down in the neck in a flex position. Uh, helmets need to be fixed and fitted to the head properly. Good neck strength is important because Newton's second law really comes into play here, especially in adolescence. You've got a playing field in sports and kids of uh, at the same age with tremendously different uh, sizes and weights and the forces that they're able to generate, again, are directly proportionate to their mass. And if you've got somebody, for instance, in football, who's about to be hit, and they've got a, just enough time to contract their neck muscles, then all of a sudden, the force of that blow to the head is going to be spread throughout the whole body. And the, the mass of the body can dissipate that force as opposed to the 15 to 16 pound weight of the head. And as always, uh, hydration, genetics, and luck play a role as well. So evaluation. What do we do? We've got somebody who's been hit. We suspect they have a concussion. People like me who do a lot of sideline work uh, become quite familiar with this. Athletic trainers, especially the athletic trainers in this state, I think have done an outstanding job of keeping their skills up and keeping really at the forefront of all this information that we're we're talking about. Uh, question number one, is the C-spine involved as well? It's also obviously uh, to this audience. Um, any head injury has the potential to have uh, a neck injury. For the purposes of our discussion, we're going to stay above the neck for the rest of the day. But again, evaluating C-spine is important. There's a pocket concussion recognition tool that is just part of that uh, new recent uh, international project that we talked about. I'll show you in a moment. 
um, some of the key things that somebody needs to be, that athlete that were suspected of having a concussion is out. They're done. I don't care if it's the star quarterback. I don't care if it is the state championship game and he decides whether we win or lose. We're done. And he's not left alone and not allowed to return to play. Some kind of sideline tricks if you're involved in that setting. And if you can picture a high school football game where you've got you know, 60 kids running up and down the sideline, take their helmet. And again, athletic trainers are very good with this. There's usually a cooler or a bag or something on the sideline that's just designated as empty. And as soon as somebody's getting evaluated, uh, somebody else on the team, um, often a student trainer, will take the helmet and they just walk it away while the athlete's engaged with the doctor or the athletic trainer. And that gets zipped up, put in a cooler, put away. And that way that person can't sneak it back out on the field. Um, Afterwards, evaluation by a professional, and the law and the standard in Nebraska is um, evaluated by typically a physician, uh, DO or MD, uh, PA or nurse practitioner. And I will give you my bias that uh, I think, as with anything, that person should have uh, specific expertise in concussion evaluation. So what are the symptoms? And I think everybody has a pretty good idea of, when we talk about concussions, what do we think about? Uh, and probably the big ones are difficulty thinking. Again, we've injured the brain, so the thought process is just gonna be thrown off. They're gonna feel like they're in a cloud or in a fog and have trouble concentrating and things are just gonna be kind of slower. Um, difficulty kind of assimilating new information and uh, they may have headaches, blurry vision, I see that less frequently. And then as symptoms go on and continue for days to weeks, then there's a lot of emotional overtones that, that come into it as well. Uh, this is that uh, concussion recognition tool. This is designed to be able just to fold up and put in a pocket. Uh, this can also be put on coaches' clipboards, those types of things. And it just kind of goes over kind of a, a list of the symptoms so somebody can kind of ask, uh, ask a suspected, uh, an athlete who's suspected of having an injury, you know, uh, are you having these symptoms? And then start kind of asking just basic questions. You know, what half is it? Where are we? Uh, what, what game did we play last week? And kind of those basic questions. And for me, it's not just looking for the correct answer. I'm looking for how they answer it. Are they focused? Are they paying attention? Are they, are they with me, or are they kind of in that uh, kind of daze, foggy, just uh, fuzzy kind of look? And for me, in the acute setting, the best test for concussion isn't any scan or blood test or list of questions, and this is totally subjective, but for me, it's the look in the eye. And when you've seen enough people who've been concussed, concussed acutely, they all kind of have the same just vacant stare and they're answering questions, but they're just not all there, and you can just kind of see it. And I, again, not objective, but I don't know any other good way to put it. So when we're following up and looking at symptoms, especially in the office, what kinds of things do we use? And what kind of the standard that has really moved forward have been kind of these graded um, symptom checks, checklists. And there are uh, several out there. Um, I tend to uh, suggest two. Um, one is the SCAT-3, which is the new recommendation from the international group. For the first time ever, we now have something for younger kids called the Child SCAT-3. Uh, and it's three because the group in their previous meetings in other great European cities went through, went through one and two. Um, but we now have a tool for five and 12 year olds. And then impact testing. Impact is a commercial company, and there are others out there. Impact's probably the one that's most well-known, where uh, an athlete sits down with a laptop and a mouse and goes through kind of a test that looks at uh, memory, timing, uh, uh, and just a lot of just spatial orientation factors. And as part of that, it goes through a system symptom checklist too. And uh, people tend to use one or the other. Sometimes people use both. 
Um, I think Dr. Terry Berry Spore and I are familiar and comfortable with using both as well. Uh, this is just kind of a, a diagram of the, the SCAT-3. There's an initial sideline assessment and again, Glasgow coma and um, the Maddox questions, like again, which half is it? And this is the, the second part of it, which uh, we would use in follow-up in the office. And this is kind of that uh, graded symptom checklist uh, that we talked about where, again, no symptoms too severe and going through things like headache, neck pain, dizziness, et cetera. And then there's the kind of physical exam and my cognitive assessment. And a big part of that too is balance. Balance is um, thrown off a lot in concussion and it's kind of one of those nice objective findings where you can really uh, get some good feedback as to how well somebody's recovering. And this is an exam example of the uh, child SCAT3, again, uh, Glasgow coma, child Maddox scores, and the uh, uh, child's reported symptoms, the parents, re excuse me, parents report of what the child's symptoms are, and then again, my objective exam. And impact, again, commercially based, works well, uh, I have I think impact is a very, very good tool. My only issue with impact is there are some people who become what I call um, impact disciples. And for me, impact is one very useful tool, but it's not my only tool in the toolbox. And where I struggle with is the concept that some people focus on, did I pass or fail my concussion test after I got concussed and they made me sit down at the computer? And did I pass or fail it? Because that determines whether or not I can go back and play. Well, yes and no. That's, it gives me useful information, but my decision on when somebody can go back, go back and play depends a lot more on just how well they scored on their test. Uh, for this audience, again, trauma, what else are we worried about besides concussion? What else could happen? Uh, with impact to the head, the two big things that I worry about, subdural and epidural hematomas. And again, in review, subdural, those are the high impact traumas, those high speed collisions. Um, the venous structures are injured. Again, we often see uh, uh, subdurals uh, concomitantly with skull fractures. And um, if the skull fractures are present, the symptoms uh, typically show up in, within minutes. Without a skull fracture, again, the bleed is slower and usually occurs over several days. And again, significant morbidity with uh, subdural hematomas. Um, epidural hematomas uh, usually occur from direct impact, like a baseball being thrown um, right at the point of the middle meningeal artery. And again, you get bleeding and kind of that classic uh, presentation of an epidural hematoma is that lucid period followed by a severe headache and then decompensation. And again, obviously a trauma, trauma center candidate. Uh, concussion management and grading. And I think everybody's probably, especially seasoned people, are familiar with grading of concussions. Are they grade one, grade two, grade three? Because your grade determines when you go back and play. And there have been several that have been thrown out there over the years. Um, Bob Cantu, who's probably one of uh, the world's most foremost experts in this field, uh, years ago published his set of guidelines. The American Academy of Neurology had theirs out. The Colorado group, who uh, I think had some uh, professional competition with Bob Cantu, uh, couldn't let his stand without uh, them putting their stamp on the subject too. But bottom line is, we don't use these anymore. These are old, and we really don't grade concussions, especially at the beginning. Kind of the new kind of thought or term that we use is our concussion, concussions either simple or complex. And if they're simple, they usually get better over a week without us having to do much of anything. Um, we really uh, don't need any for formal neuropsych testing. Um, we do kind of basic mental status screening. And most of, uh, most of these people, especially in their late teens, 20s, and into adulthood, uh, again, resolve pretty quickly and uh, don't need much in the way of follow-up. Uh, for handling complex concussions, 
that's when we need to think about that you know, five to 10% of people who aren't following the basic simple path and what do we need to do with them. And the recommendations of the expert groups is those concussions should be managed by psychologists and neuropsychologists who have the experience and who know what they're doing and uh, by physicians with specific expertise in the area and they specific, specifically mention neurology, neurosurgery, and sports medicine. And in our setting, in our group, I tend to suggest sports medicine. Uh, the neurologists in this part of the country are overwhelmed. If you call neurology and try to get an appointment, they will give you one probably anywhere from four to eight months out. Um, neurosurgery, this is not a, concussion by definition is not a surgical problem. And as a physician, I try to have the surgeon see surgical pathology, and as the non-surgeon, I try to take as much of the non-surgical stuff away from them as I can. So in sports medicine, I see a lot of these. Imaging. Um, if, if all we have is a concussion, and I don't want to say all, but if a child is concussed, by definition, CT and MRI are normal. What we'll use CT and MR for is evaluating for something else. So do we have a subdural or epidural hematoma? Um, and does that kind of get clouded if there's prolonged loss of consciousness, if somebody has worsening symptoms or has like a focal neurologic deficit? Is there something going on in a specific location in the brain that you glean from history or exam? But again, CTs and concussions are not needed, or excuse me, CTs and MR are not needed for simple concussions. I've had families come into the office after being seen uh, both in the children's emergency room and other outlying emergency rooms and they came in for concussion evaluation and the parents, it's usually the dads for this one is unusual, but the dads are upset because they didn't scan my kid's head. And I have to take a moment to sit down and explain if they didn't have a reason to do it, I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad they didn't take your child and blast their brain with a whole bunch of radiation that they were confident wasn't necessary and would have been normal anyway. And that usually can get people calmed down. Um, some specific points, helmet use. In football in this country, since the late 1970s when the uh, current basic helmet design was implemented, um, the incidence of skull fractures has dropped to essentially zero. And the helmets that people wear, especially in playing football, were designed to prevent skull fractures. We are nowhere close to having a helmet design uh, to be able to prevent concussions and dissipate those forces. So when people talk about uh, concussion-proof helmets, it's all marketing, it's bunk, the science behind it is just isn't there. Years ago it was thrown out there that uh, mouthpieces will help prevent concussions. And it seemed logical that if somebody got hit in the chin, the mouthpiece could cushion the blow and that you dissipate the forces to the brain and reduce, uh, reduce the chance of developing a concussion. The data doesn't bear that out, so mouthpieces do not prevent concussions either. Still wear a mouthpiece, especially in collision sports, because they work great for preventing dental injuries. Uh, when I'm talking to coaches groups, I always make a point to, you know, point out that they don't prevent concussions, but don't walk out of here saying, Moffitt says you don't need to wear mouthpieces because you still do. And um, again, neck strength, like we talked about before, is critical. But rule changing, rule changes are important, especially in collision sports. You know, proper tackling. Football's an incredibly safe sport as long as kids learn how to tackle correctly. Not head down, not head to head, and if they're taught that as they grow and develop, then again, our chances of uh, developing an injury on either side of the ball reduce, uh, are reduced significantly. Um, sliding in hockey, uh, stick use in hockey and lacrosse, again, uh, all affect um, concussion, concussion incidents. Uh, this is a great old quote that I love. And I go back to the beginning when I started talking about what do we know about concussion and how has it changed? And uh, there was a, a team physician who wrote, in a case that any man in any game got hurt by a hit on the head so that he did not realize what he was doing,
His teammates should at, one, should at once insist that time be called and that a doctor come onto the field to see what is the trouble. And also that every man on the squad must make up his mind that in case he gets hurt, to have a friend with him from the time of the injury until noon of the next day to prevent any serious results from the beginning without anyone being around. And that goes back to 1905, Harvard University, a team physician, Edward Nichols. And in many ways, we haven't come very far since then. We know a lot more, but the basics are still the same. Supervision and rest and allow people to, um, to recover. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. Okay. Um, in case you're wondering why a neuropsychologist is standing up here talking to a trauma group and about a very medically oriented issue, it's because neuropsychology as a field got really interested in how do we measure recovery patterns from milder brain injuries, because we knew they didn't show up on scans. We knew that CTs and MRIs weren't giving us the answers, but we were still seeing these impairments in individuals for days, sometimes weeks. And so the field that I belong to started looking at how can we detect it, and we found it on these measures of processing speed and cognition and things that help us determine when is an individual cognitively recovered as well as physically recovered. And it became a primary area of interest in our field and also a primary interest in mine. And so that's, that's how I came to be here. But along the way, I uh, learned about a lot of other kinds of brain injuries and things as well that I use in my professional practice. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of pick up where Dr. Moffat left off and talk about a lot of what we do at Madonna as well in terms of return to play and return to learn. Because what happens in our population is we often get that 5% or so that doesn't recover well. Um, it depends on the literature you look at, five to 20% of individuals following a concussion won't follow a normal recovery curve. And for five years, I studied high school athletes in the state of Nebraska and collected data on recovery patterns and saw hundreds of them, literally, and followed their recovery. And what we found is the same thing that you saw in Dr. Moffat's literature. Um, and that is that it takes about seven to 10 days to recover from a concussion if you're a young, healthy adult without other comorbid conditions. But it gets much more complicated to predict and it's a much more complicated recovery pattern if you do have other comorbid conditions or if you've had previous concussions. And what do we do when we have those individuals that don't recover according to the plan? And so we'll talk about that today. So first of all, what's the role of the health the healthcare provider? What's your role as those individuals that see them first? Okay. One of them is to set up those positive expectations for recovery. We know most individuals are gonna recover just fine. They aren't gonna need a lot of in intensive treatment. If we can keep them safe and not having a second injury in those next few days and weeks, they will re often recover quite well. We know from the literature that 90% of second concussions happen within 10 days of the first. And we believe we know why, although the research isn't hard and fast on this. It's probably those changes in reaction time, changes in balance, changes in ability to react to the environment that puts you at greater risk during that time. And so part of it is setting up those early positive expectations, but also talking to that patient about safety. How do you prevent yourself from getting injured again during that time? Educating them on why specific symptoms are present, why are you having headaches? How long will they likely last? Why are you having dizziness? This is part of the typical concussive pattern. It's fairly typical to be light sensitive, noise sensitive during this time. You can expect that to last for a few days, sometimes a few weeks. That's normal. It doesn't always go away overnight. It usually does go away. Adjusting their behavior. That means that you don't wanna push it in these next few days and weeks. Until you feel better, we're gonna back off. We're gonna give you some time to recover. I'm gonna tell you how to do that. And we'll talk through return to play and return to learn today. You're gonna to give them some specific guidelines for daily activity in terms of what should they be doing over the next 24 hours, over the next week. How, often, how soon do they need to come back to see you or to follow up with their primary care provider? Because they need those guidelines. That information, although it's out there, it hasn't been widely disseminated to the general public. So they need to know, what should I do over these next few days and weeks to keep myself safe? 
and you're going to closely monitor symptoms and refer for further assessment if not resolving as anticipated. One of the problems I think we still have sporadically employed in our healthcare system is a lot of these kids get seen immediately but never told to follow up. So nobody's checking on did their headaches go away? Did their memory come back and are they doing well in school? Are they able to learn according to what is normal expectations for them developmentally? So I think it's really important that we make sure that we're following these kids and, and releasing them back when they're fully well, which hopefully is a matter of a few days. Okay, so let's talk about return to activity and what are the current recommendations for that. Return to activity is actually the combination of two things. That means return to learn and return to play. And when you think about it, really return to learn should be primary. We need to get them back to school and functioning well before we put them back out in a situation where they could possibly get re-injured. Now everybody comes in asking about return to play because that's how they got injured and they're not even thinking about return to learn a lot of times. But return to learn really does come first. It's, it should be getting them back to school, doing well in school, being successful there, and then we'll get them back on the athletic field. So how do we do that? I think one of our goals should be to really have good communication up front. It is best to have communication between the healthcare provider and the school prior to a student returning to the classroom. There's several reasons for this should try and get releases in place, but the primary reason is to set that student up for success. I've had quite a few kids in my office who've come in, they've already failed several tests, their headaches are getting worse and they don't know why, and it's not because their injury is getting worse, it's because the stress they're under and the failure they're experiencing is causing stress exacerbation of their headaches usually. We're having all kinds of problems because they weren't set up from the beginning to be successful at school. No one even told the teachers that they had had a concussion and that they might need some short-term accommodations, short-term modifications. So ideally, we should really be communicating up front, helping the parents to do that, preferably doing that in ourselves, getting that mechanism in place for letting them know we'll be sending this student back. They may need some extra breaks during the day. They may need some help with getting full sets of notes because their attention and concentration has been impacted. We expect this to be short term, but please be accommodating to those needs. Nebraska status, in our state, return to play is now at least partially legislated in terms of the fact that we are told we should not return to play the same day if there's a question of concussion, that someone experienced, a medical provider or a healthcare provider experienced in the assessment of concussion should make the determination for return to play. So we do have some of that legislative process in place for return to play. We do not yet for return to learn. Although that is under development, there's some really good committee work going on right now in our state to get the word out there on how universally return to learn should happen, and it's based on standards that are now in the literature and out there. So we'll talk through that as well. So management involves initially resting. We want to really give that brain a chance to heal, but that's for the short term. Okay? It seems to, we don't have good solid literature on this, and I'll admit this isn't necessarily solid evidence-based practice yet. It's really clinical in terms of that the kids who take a couple days of rest seem to get over this more quickly when they don't push themselves on through. Um, but we're waiting for the research to back that up. But this is what's out there in terms of recommendations for practice. It's in these new standards that you'll look at. Um, and so this is still what most of us are saying is rest for the short term, take a couple days off, Give yourself a break, allow your brain time to recover, to come back online, so to speak. Prevent re-injury by doing so, and hopefully we're going to get you better faster. So when we talk about that, we usually talk about managing both the physical and the cognitive activity levels for those first few days, because this does appear to help decrease the duration. So by physical rest, Usually what we are telling individuals is that means definitely no sports. That's a high risk for re-injury, so we don't want those. No exercise initially. 
That doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to keep them out of exercise in the long term. We may well, even if they're symptomatic, ease them back into exercise a few weeks down the road. But in those first few days, we're really going to back off. Okay? So no sports, no exercise, no weightlifting, no major exertional activities. That includes physical education or PE classes. They should rest and take a break. Then we're going to ease them back in, generally, based on their symptom recurrence. If the symptoms come back, we're probably going to back off again. But this is kind of the consensus now, is looking at how do we ease them back in and not make things worse, but make it better. It also includes, and this is what's surprising to most people, and this is, I will admit, some people question this, whether we have sufficient research to say that this is the way we should handle it. I think the majority of the literature that you'll find will support this, but there are definitely people who question whether the mental cognitive side of rest is that important. I will still go with, I think at least for the first couple days, it's a very good idea. The kids seem to do better. If they do not do prolonged concentration, no prolonged homework, no prolonged classes or block scheduling, no prolonged days at school, we ease them back in and I'll show you the protocol that we follow for that. So that also means limiting screen time. And this, I don't, this probably gets the most resistance of all. <laughs> if you tell kids, stay off your computer and hand over your phone, oh my gosh, you'd, you'd think you'd just upset their whole world. But the, a lot of kids do not rest if they've got a screen right by them. You know, they just don't. They're texting constantly around the clock. I have caught my daughter taking texts at 2 in the morning. You know, that's not conducive to good rest. So limiting, at least limiting screen time and limiting cell time, many practitioners will tell you they should have none for the first couple days at least, is probably beneficial in allowing them to truly rest during those first few days. Okay. What we're trying to prevent is a problem sometimes referred to as chronic brain injury, which is the idea that after multiple concussions, individuals have chronic problems, oftentimes with headaches. You've all seen the 60-minute reports probably of the soccer players who have these chronic headaches that they just can't get rid of that we suspect is from multiple concussions, but also problems with learning, problems with academic performance, lowered neuropsych scores in the areas of memory and learning in particular, but also attention sometimes can be impacted. Slower speed of information processing and slower reaction time, and so we certainly don't want that as our outcome. So how does return to learn work? Well, typically return to learn works kind of similar to return to play. It follows the same concept. Return to learn, you start out at home with total rest, and then once the symptoms start to kind of dissipate, hopefully they go away entirely. But sometimes we can't wait till they go away entirely before we start progressing. But start to dissipate, we move up to home with light mental activity, so start adding in some things at home, maybe bringing home a few pieces of homework, seeing how long they can tolerate. Then going back to school part-time with built-in breaks, no testing, and modification of assignments. Hopefully, if we've got an injury on Friday night, by Monday or Tuesday, we're ready to go back to school at least part-time. But it depends on the kid. Some of them can't. Some of them, we really just have to go at a much slower pace, particularly if they've had multiple concussions. It depends. It really, and this is why having someone involved who understands this process is important. Then we progress to attending school part-time with some accommodations, then attending school full-time with no standardized tests, but routine tests, okay. So we're not gonna have them take their ACTs or the California exams or things like that yet, but start in with the routine testing and see how they do. Maybe some accommodations like extended time on tests, things like that. And then hopefully fairly quickly, in most cases, we'll be back to school full-time with no accommodations. So hopefully this progresses within the matter of a few days to a couple weeks in most kids, but there are exceptions to that. There are systems in place in our state to actually support that process or individuals with more severe brain injuries with re school reintegration. There are the Brain Injury Regional School Support Teams, which are referred to as the BURST Teams. And each region actually has a designated person who's on a burst team, 
who can help walk you and your school through that process. And so all schools in Nebraska have access to BURST. You can contact a BURST team member when you have a student who needs assistance transitioning into the classroom after a brain injury. Team members can help identify strategies to support student success, including training and consultation for concussion management, information on brain injury and resources, methods to reintegrate students with peers, and support for students struggling with new identities. This is super helpful when you've got a kid with a moderate to a severe injury who really has some long-term impactful changes. But if this, this is the first time your school's ever tried to manage a more substantial concussive injury, the BURST team members can be invaluable in helping the school with that. So be aware that those are available. These are the, additional, the different regional um, contacts for BURST. And so here in the metro area, it's Andrea McDonald at Bellevue Public Schools. She is more than happy to help facilitate that process if you've got an individual with brain injury working on school reintegration. But everyone in the state should have access to those resources. OK, so this is all developed fairly quickly. Does, how many of you here in the room realize that we have a concussion law in Nebraska? Okay. Maybe half or so? Okay. The first ones were actually passed in 2009 in Washington and Oregon. We now have 48 states with concussion return to play laws. Pretty good. It's happened fast. It's the fastest health care legislation has ever moved through our system. It's very, actually very rare that we legislate healthcare practice. This has been the exception because they've taken it so seriously. But mostly it's focused on youth athletes. And our law in the state of Nebraska is a little bit unique because we didn't just apply it to school activities, it's all youth sports. So these, this is supposed to be followed even by YMCA and church leagues. It applies to everyone in all youth activities. And that's an important distinction as it makes everyone, including volunteer coaches, somewhat responsible for understanding that we don't put kids back when they have concussive symptoms. We don't. I mean, at that level, that basic understanding needs to be understood by every person in our state. It was enacted on July 1st of 2012, and so it's been in place for almost a year. And our law says that we are supposed to provide coach and parent athlete education every year offer it. They don't have to take it. We don't have to have a system. There is a law in place in one state, I believe it's Virginia, where they actually have to log in and, and indicate that they've completed the education if they coach. Our state doesn't require that they take it. It requires that it be offered. The player must be removed from play if they exhibit signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with a concussion, meaning that if we suspect a concussion, that player needs to be taken out and evaluated. There should be no continuing on and seeing what's happened. They cannot return to play that same day. This applies to 18 and younger in our state. So essentially all high school athletes. The age of majority in our state is 19, so they applied it to 18 and under. And they cannot return to play until asymptomatic and cleared to return by a trained healthcare professional. Now that's somewhat self imposed whether you believe you have sufficient training in this area or not. Um, that's a hard thing in terms of what meets the criteria, but certainly I think it's, it's worth asking, you know, do you manage concussions regularly? Because there is quite a bit of knowledge that's involved in it in terms of understanding how to educate on return to play, return to activity, and what you're looking for. Okay, so this is how gradual return to play works. Very similar to what I talked to you through in terms of return to learn. You rest until symptom free and it may be appropriate to stay home from school for a few days and limit assignments. And this is a little more strict in terms of return to learn. We do send kids back to school with some symptoms regularly. We don't want to keep them out too long. Uh, we can't keep them home if they're symptomatic for three weeks. You know, we're trying to get them back in there. Return to play is a little different. We hardly ever, it should be never really, put a child back into athletic play if they're still symptomatic. They need to rest and stay away from athletic activity until they are asymptomatic. Then we try and get them back to school. That comes first. Then light exercise. Then running. Then full non-contact drills. Then full contact practice or training. 
and then play and game. And usually this progresses no faster than about one step every 24 hours. So reintegration into play usually takes about a week to do in terms of getting them back gradually. And someone should be following them during this time for reemergence of symptoms. Um, in the larger school systems, a lot of times we have certified athletic trainers on staff who can help with this. It gets a little more complicated in terms of asking parents to facilitate that and asking um, you know, local healthcare providers to help educate and facilitate this when you know, we're working with a kid in a rural environment. Basically educating them on your body tells you what you need to be doing. If you get slamming headaches, dizziness, you're nauseous when you're out there on the field, that means you've tried this too soon and we need to back off. And really doing quite a bit of educational work with them on paying attention to what their body's telling them. There are some specific courses on concussion and concussion management that have been proved, approved by the Nebraska um, Health and Human Services Department. And so these are those particular courses that they've looked at and said meet the criteria for coaching education in our state. You can access them all through their website. If you'd like to look at that content, it's all free. Um, all of them have fairly similar content. I've looked at every one of them. There's a lot of overlap in the content. Um, most of it is um, just reiterations of what I'm telling you today, although I don't think any of them have incorporated the return to learn information yet. They're all talking about return to play. So why do we do this computerized testing stuff? Uh, Dr. Moffitt mentioned impact, and impact is a tool that's probably the most widely used here in the United States. Um, there are three others that are commercially available, Headminders, Cogsport, and ANAM, used much less frequently. The concept behind all of them is that there are subtle cognitive or neuropsychological, the terms get used quite a bit interchangeably, they're very similar, subtle cognitive deficits that can help detect recovery. But I totally agree with what Dr. Moffat said in terms of they are one tool in an arsenal in terms of understanding good concussion management. Never should computerized testing be used without a good clinical evaluation, without a symptom checklist and understanding the symptoms without a good interview of what other comorbid conditions might this child be experiencing. Do they have a history of learning difficulties? Do they have a history of headaches? Um, how many times have they had injuries? What other kinds of conditions are we dealing with? Because there's all kinds of other factors that can be contributing to the recovery and a simple test score should not be a red light, green light mechanism. So although I think these are wonderful tools, they were developed out of my field, I totally believe in what they do and what they help us to do. They should not be used in isolation. Um, one of the things that we run into sometimes with the impact testing is sometimes we don't have baselines. In an ideal world, impact testing is designed to be given prior to any risk of injury, so like summer camps, um, prior to the start of the season, and then re-administered so you can compare against what is that individual's own normal. So, in other words, you've got a football player who takes the impact test the first week of August before they go into contact play. In October, they suffer a blow to the head. We're wondering if maybe this has had some significant impact. And so after the headaches clear and things, we go back and we retest and we say, okay, symptoms are gone, because that's primary. Test results don't really matter if you still have symptoms. And then we look at, has the, is the memory back to normal? Is the reaction time back to normal? Are they gonna be safe on the field of play because they can react normally? And so when we don't have that, then the question becomes, can we use normative samples? In other words, can we use all 15-year-old males that have been tested on this as a comparison basis, and will that tell us if they're okay or not? And there's a lot of pros and cons to that, and I could discuss that at length because that's my area, but it becomes much less reliable when you do it that way because kids have strengths in some areas and weaknesses in some areas. So if you really want to be able to utilize impact testing in an ideal world, you really want to have baselines because they are very helpful in terms of making solid interpretations. There are other issues that can affect performance on there. Certainly motivation. I get calls all the time. I don't understand why this kid's got less than the first percentile across the board. And you know, if they've got less than the first percentile across the board on an impact test, that's an invalid test. 
something's going on. And we have to do some problem solving as to why. You know? And so there can be motivation issues, there can be validity issues, there can also be pre-morbid learning issues. If you don't have a baseline and you know this kid had pre-morbid learning issues, you have to take that into account in your interpretation. So there are other things to think about. Okay, so we've covered most of this information here. Most kids are going to recover within one to two weeks, but there are some that have persistent difficulties. So what happens if they don't recover as expected? Then what do we do? Where do we send them? What happens next? When post-concussion symptoms persist, it often signals the presence of undiagnosed or undertreated comorbid conditions. In other words, when they got the concussion, there may have been something else that happened that needs to be treated. There may be something that even occurred prior to the concussion that needs to be treated that's been exacerbated by the concussion. Um, we need to look for what are the things that we haven't treated yet. And delaying appropriate identification of those can lead to ongoing symptoms that can become chronic, like chronic headaches. It can lead to certainly failure in the classroom. Frustration, because all these kids want to do is play. It's all they want to do. You know? And so really, if they are having symptoms at two weeks or longer, we need to start looking at what other workup can be done to figure it out. Why are they having these symptoms? And we've run a, a, a mild TBI clinic at Madonna now for about 14 years we're going on. Um, it covers all kinds of mild TBI, not just sports concussion. But we've collected some data on why do people come there. And what happens is most of the time they've got something else going on that needs to be treated. These are the common comorbidities that we see in that clinic. Things like post-traumatic headaches, balance and vestibular disorders, post-traumatic vision syndromes, whiplash type injuries, orthopedic pain, disrupted sleep-wake cycles, depression and anxiety, and undiagnosed premorbid learning difficulties, all of which can potentially maintain symptoms following a concussion. And so the goal of our clinic is to look at which of these things are present and how can we address them? How can we get this person on the right track? What the individual will come in complaining of oftentimes is difficulty completing tasks at home, reduced play and activity and irritability with challenges, and then at school, difficulties with concentration, remembering directions, feeling disorganized, difficulty with completing assignments, fatigue, falling behind, re reduced grades, not doing well in school anymore. Parents bring them in and say, nothing's going right. I can't seem to get this back on track. And when we look, we find those comorbid conditions. They'll complain about having difficulty concentrating, feeling organized, losing their train of thought. But when you look at that list of comorbid conditions, what one professional can assess, diagnose, and treat all of those? It's a pretty complex picture, right? Can you think of anyone? Here's, I'll go back and show you the list. What do you think? It's a pretty tough list to have a single professional look at. It really becomes important in our view, and I think we're getting some literature to support this now, it's in the newest consensus statement uh, that multidisciplinary teams really do the best job of managing these complex concussions. Because of that, you're going to need someone to do the differential diagnosis on the headache. Is the headache coming from cervical origin? Is it coming from occipital origin? Is it tension through the shoulders? Is it musculoskeletal? Is it pre-existing migraine? Is it vision induced because of visual strain? There's all kinds of reasons people get headaches. Somebody's gonna have to differentially diagnose why that's going on. Balance and vestibular disorders, typically it's PTs that specialize in that and they can do a good thorough assessment of why the balance and vestibular issues are there. Post-traumatic vision syndromes, typically that's going to be a real rehabilitation neurooptometrist who does that type of work, who really understands not just how the eyes work, but how does the brain process visual information. Might be a specially trained OT who does work in that area. Um, whiplash, again, could be a physiatrist, could be a PT, may even be an OT that contributes to the assessment of that. 
Of course, when you start talking about things like disrupted sleep-wake cycles, is that physiological or is that psychological? And it might be either the physician or it might be the neuropsychologist who problem solves that. Of course, you've got the depression and anxiety issues there. And then who assesses for the pre-morbid learning difficulties? Because that's a different type of testing that might fall under the purview of a psychologist or maybe a speech-language pathologist. So it really becomes more than one professional by the time we get that complex. And so our team includes all of those. It's an MD. In our case, we use a physiatrist. Another clinic might use a neurologist for that or a sports medicine physician who has particular expertise in concussion. Um, but certainly, physician services is an important part of coordinating the medical aspect of this program. But also physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, neuropsychology, neurooptometry, an educational specialist who's going to communicate with the school in a language that the school can understand and implement. Who's going to help them with those 504 plans, those MDT plans, whatever they need to do a good job there? And who's going to put it all together? The case manager. So I think the multidisciplinary team is key in managing concussion, and it needs to be the goal that we have it available to all of our athletes with complex concussion recoveries. Hopefully, by using that approach, we can fairly quickly get things on track, minimize disability, minimize failure at school, get them on track both educationally and then return them back to play. Occasionally, we can't make everything go away. It does happen, and the longer people have been symptomatic, the harder it is to treat. We know our success rate with treatment goes dramatically down after three months of chronic symptoms. So our goal is to get them in before that point. But if that does happen, then our goal is to treat adaptive strategies. In other words, how can you compensate for those areas where you're still having difficulties? How can you still perform well at school? How can you accept what's happened to you and find a way to move on and still reach your goals? And so that's a large part of what happens in rehab as well. So I'm going to wrap this up with a quick case example, and then we should have a couple minutes to take questions. Jamie's a 14-year-old female who was injured in basketball game last June. She was referred to me by her PCP for evaluation of possible post-concussive syndrome at 22 days post-injury. She presents to my office with a headache which she ranks ranging uh, best case scenario is a four, worst case scenario is a six on a 10 point scale, pain scale. So she has kind of a range depending on what she's doing. She has fatigue, difficulty concentrating and remembering, mild complaints of nausea, balance issues, dizziness, nervousness, and trouble falling asleep. Pretty typical picture of post-concussive type syndromes. A lot of times you don't get the PCS diagnosis at 22 days, you get it at three months, but it's that constellation of symptoms it presents. The results of the impact testing indicated a significant impairment in all areas or invalidity. She had less than the first percentile on most of the areas measured. So we're like, what's going on there? So there was definitely that question out there. So we recommended no contact play or major exertion till symptom resolution and reevaluation. I went ahead and helped, referred her to the rest of the mild TBI team with physician input for evaluation and addressing of symptoms. So she received PT for her dizziness and headaches, OT to rule out any visual disturbances that may be contributing to the cognitive complaints or headaches, speech therapy to address cognitive and communication issues, psych for strategies to minimize anxiety, and we were holding on the educational specialist because it was summertime. We're like, okay, we'll give this a little bit, we'll do the other treatments. If we need education involved, we'll get them involved before she goes back to school in August. So PT made good progress on reducing headaches, but noticed report of symptom resumption when friend was in a car accident in August. So we started to see a pattern of stress exacerbation. When she was anxious and she was tense, symptoms went up. OT did not identify any significant visual disturbances at the time, so she didn't need that type of intervention. Speech therapy worked on compensatory strategies and then involved education towards the end of the summer to provide support as she transitioned back to her school. Psych interventions helped Jamie to learn that many of her symptoms were quickly exacerbated when she was anxious because it increased the muscular tension in her shoulders and neck, 
They worked on relaxation training and other positive coping strategies. In other words, part of what was probably going on with her testing is she was kind of freaking out. She was having anxiety type symptoms and she was not able to focus well and it was increasing her headaches and everything. So we really had to work on educating her on the effects of anxiety and how to manage that. That in combination with what the PTs did seemed to make a difference. Plus speech trained her in how do you organize yourself? How do you reduce your stress load by organizing, by using these memory tools, by using these types of techniques? Did a reevaluation at three months, 12 days post injury, and that indicated resolution of the headaches except when she was under stress. Here's her impact summary. So at uh, 22 days post injury, she had a less than the first percentile score on verbal memory, visual memory, visual motor speed, reaction time, and impulse control. You see where I'm talking about here. Impulse control was four and a symptom score of 15. So she wasn't off the charts in terms of symptoms, but that's still way more than you want to live with long term. She was still having quite a few. By the three month date, she was at the 20th percentile on verbal memory, 32nd percentile on visual memory, 38th on visual motor speed, 38th on reaction time, and her symptom score was down to a two. Now these scores all fall within the lower side of the average range to the low average range. The 20th percentile is usually labeled low average, but none of them are considered impaired. Okay? So we were definitely making progress. Okay. We recommended cautious return to playing volleyball, no basketball yet, with slow progression over the course of two to three weeks. So we let her start resuming return to play in a lower risk activity. Volleyball is not without risk. Every year I see at least probably two kids with volleyball concussions. Usually they go up for a hit and they trip coming down, they fall on the back of their head. Seems to happen every year. But it's lower risk certainly than basketball and football. She returned to conditioning and subsequently playing with the volleyball team with no increase of symptoms. She played basketball this winter without difficulties. The school provided minimal supports when she went back in the fall and they phased it out by the end of the semester. Basically, she had to learn how to manage her anxiety for her symptoms to get better. She had to have some work on that head and shoulders and neck region because she had a lot of musculoskeletal stuff going on, and she got better. But she wasn't gonna get better without those treatments. She had to have them. So to wrap it up for today, we'll take some liability off, puts it back on the onus of the healthcare system. And hopefully it overall improves the athletic system performance because we don't have kids out there with multiple injuries, hopefully. We're getting them back and we're getting them back safely. We have to continue to collaborate and educate, teaching fair play. You know, there's been some new rules in terms of what are appropriate tackles. Uh, you know, how do we prevent some of this stuff from happening? Teaching detection of injury, what do you look for? Teaching every coach to have that little um, detection of injury sheet on their clipboard. Um, when we train at the YMCA, we give them a clipboard that has it printed on there because that means they've got it with them all the time. If they've got their clipboard, it's there. Learning to recognize the clinical features of concussion, putting in place proper assessment strategies, following the return to play principles, and then referring for further evaluation if they're not getting better in a timely manner. I think if we put this system in place, we will really see much better outcomes for our kids. The best treatment is obviously prevention. If we can help prevent it from happening, and certainly helping the secondary injuries from happening, we'll all be better off. So that's the end, I think, of what we had to present. We would be happy to take a few questions if you'd like. Uh, yeah, her question was um, whether we're getting reimbursement for the multidisciplinary clinic. And actually, yes, um, we, we pretty regularly get paid by insurance. It's a medical diagnosis. Um, there's usually sufficient evidence that there are symptoms to substantiate it. Um, and usually for the assessments, and even the treatment portion is pretty well reimbursed. I can't say it with 100%. I mean, obviously, we do the pre-authorizations, but it's not a significant problem for us. Mm -hmm. um, I agree it is just one thing in your toolbox that you have, but on very competitive athletes, um, a lot of the symptoms of concussions are subjective. So, And I just know from my son, if he had a concussion, he would lie through his teeth to say that he had no headache, that he was fine. So that's one bit of a safety net I feel that we have, because they do test the pre um, scores, and that at least the test would catch money. I hope. 
You want to take? Sure. And I'll agree. Uh, talking about uh, impact testing and how that can affect and how it can be manipulated. And some of the research that's been done on impact has also shown how you do the pretest matters. In other words, if you have 30 adolescent boys in August thrown into a computer lab, you're going to get one set of scores versus you know, sitting an individual around by himself in a quiet lab. And athletes are smart for the most part, and some athletes want to cheat and manipulate the system. And these kids have also learned, some have learned, that if they sandbag the pretest, then if they get hurt, they've got a lower bar to reach later in the season. And uh, that's a validity issue as well. Can I Can expand sure. on that? Uh, that's why you want someone checking your baselines. Um, I've seen the mistake happen in some school systems where they're really trying to do the right thing. They go in and they universally give baseline testing and they put them in the files or they leave them in the computer system and no one ever pulls up the scores to check for validity. It's somewhat hard to sandbag the impact test without getting a really low score that looks suspicious. And if you put in place in the school system someone who checks the validity of those up front, you'll catch a lot of those ones who are trying to do that. And you don't have to get real confrontational about it. You can just say, you know, we're not sure your test scores turned out quite right. We'd like to encourage you to sit down and do your best on this and try again. And we can catch some of those up front so we've got better baselines. But you want someone checking those. In my experience, usually not. Um, in part because a lot of the people who are giving the testing don't know what they're looking for. Um, you know, they just, they need to find someone who understands the impact well enough to just run through that database and say, mm, this one doesn't look right, you know. But um, I would encourage you to talk with, if you're involved in that process, to talk with whoever's giving you access to impact about checking validity. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, so my questions, um, first of all, how do we stop getting so many CTs um, is my first question. If it appears to be a simple concussion, I applaud you and how you respond to the parents, but how can we get that universally across the board so that we are getting far fewer CTs on these patients' heads? Uh, two, um, despite this law being enacted over a year ago, I have personally gone to my children's coaches and asked them, do you know what this law is? Have you done this? They have no idea what I'm talking about. So yes, the law exists, but I don't know how much it has infiltrated our sporting uh, system. And then the third question is, and I asked this last year, how does boxing exist? The purpose of boxing is to give the other person a concussion. So if that is, is happening, how are they able to go back to boxing again? All right, I'll field most of those. Um, <laughs> CT scan, continuing education. I mean, it's, it was to the point years ago, and in some places probably now, where if you show up in the ER and your main symptom is my head hurts or I got hit in the head, you automatically get a CT scan. And that just ABC, you just got it. And thankfully, I think we're moving away from that. Um, I would like to see uh, some institutions move a little bit faster, but that's kind of, uh, kind of the movement afoot, if you will. And on, I'll jump to the boxing question. Um, I, I share your opinion. I mean, it's, boxing is the only sport where the intent of the sport is to injure your opponent. And um, I just, personally have some ethical issues with that too. And the, the academy's taken the stand, you know, uh, as far as youth boxing goes, uh, no head contact. And if you're not doing any head contact in boxing, I'm not quite sure what you're doing. But uh, I guess the conditioning is good. And uh, regarding the, the law, it is what it is. And it's, the ignorance of the law is not an excuse. And the way it's written, any organized sport 
So if you've got the neighborhood kids who go down to the sandlot and play baseball, they don't need concussion education. But if there is an adult and it's organized in any way, even if it's volunteer and there's not a entry fee to get your kid involved in it, you are still required by law to do concussion education, offer it for the coaches, and um, provide at least some form of education to the parents and athletes. Um, they say any time a, a medical research comes out, it takes 20 years before it comes, becomes common clinical practice. That's, that's what they cite out there. Um, I think we're early on in getting this universally out there. I know the Nebraska School Activities Association has made it a high priority and they're trying to do education with the coaches in the schools, but that still only catches our public high school coaches. And so we've got a whole lot of other people to try and get out there too. I know the uh, Brain Injury Association in Nebraska has really been working on identifying mechanisms for doing that. Safe Kids has really been working on mechanisms for doing that. But it is a huge challenge that we face, how to reach the volunteer coaches who do, you know, Little League and really don't have access to someone who says this is what you have to know. So we just keep working at it. So I should keep bugging them. Keep bugging them. All of us, every one of you, make a goal this weekend to bug a coach. <laughs> so, thank you.